David was at a breaking point in his life. He was at an extremity in his life. One author has said, Saul had driven him from his own country. The Philistines had driven him from their camp. The Amalekites had plundered his city, taken his wives and his friends' wives captive, and his own men spoke of stoning him. I would say David was in a crisis and at a breaking point in his life. And if that wasn't enough, I think David probably rightly felt that he was partially at blame because he had failed to be a good leader to leave some protection for the camp of those left behind. So he was partially to blame for the situation. And not only that, I think he probably also had a gnawing sense of guilt. Because as we've seen here, when we recall back in chapter 27, he said, there's nothing better for me than to go to the land of the Philistines. And he didn't inquire of God. He didn't seek the prophet. He didn't seek the priest. He just, I think, reasoned in the flesh. And it says, he said to himself, and he left. And then he'd been walking in the flesh, and not only walking in the flesh, but I believe that he had also been living a life of deception before Achish, king of Gath, for 16 months. So he had all these things against him, and he was partially to blame, and I think he also probably had a gnawing sense of guilt. All these things were against him. And now he was at this breaking point. What should he do And what could he do? And maybe we could ask ourselves, have we ever felt like the walls were caving in or closing in around us? That everyone was against us? And perhaps also, even some of those reasons might be in some way our own making or fault. And what could we do or can we do? What should we do? Well, is there any hope? Are there answers for us? Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30 because I think in God's word we can look at David and his experience and I think there are some great answers for us. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Then it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day. And if you remember, David had lived in Ziklag for about 16 months. He'd gone over to the Philistines, and Achish king of Gath had given him this small city to be their base camp. And so David and his men lived there, and he had 600 men with him, and he had their wives and their children and his two wives. So there were a number of people there, and this was his base camp, and he would go out and make raids. And as you remember last week, the Philistines were going to battle against Israel and against Saul, and they had called David, or at least Achish had to help. But then the Philistines looked around and they said, what are these Hebrews doing behind us? And of course, Saul would be in front of them. So they said, send them away. And Achish didn't want to, but he prevailed. So he sent David back to Ziklag. And so David goes back to Ziklag. And it says that they came to Ziklag on the third day. The Amalekites had made a raid on the Negev and on Ziklag and had overthrown Ziklag and burned it with fire. So you see, he goes back and his whole city where they had lived was burned to the ground. And they took captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great, without killing anyone, and carried them off and went their way. So not only was the city burned with fire, but his wives and his friends' wives and their children were taken captive by the Amalekites. And if you remember, Saul was supposed to have destroyed the Amalekites, but he didn't. And they survived to continue to cause problems. And when David and his men came to the city, behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted their voices and wept until there was no strength in them to weep. And so we would say that they were at an extremity. We would say they were, and he was at a breaking point, and we would say he was certainly made weak. But if that's not bad enough, look at the next verse. Well, now David's two wives 
had been taken captive, Ohinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Carmelite. Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him. For all the people were embittered, each one because of his sons and his daughters. In other words, they thought, David, you're the leader. Why didn't you leave someone to protect them? Why did you just leave and go to Achish? In other words, they're questioning him and in part blaming him for what has happened. And I would say this was an extremity. I would say the walls were closing in. I would say he was at a breaking point. And what did he do? And I think the key to the whole passage is the last sentence in verse 6. And it says, But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David strengthened himself in God. David strengthened himself in God. That's wonderful because it seems like for 16 months, David had kind of been walking in the flesh. For 16 months, we don't see any sign of him uh, speaking with the prophet. We don't see him inquiring of the Lord through the ephod. We don't really see him praying. But here, though, David is at a, as a breaking point, and it says he strengthened himself in God. Now, that word there is a word that can mean take courage. He took courage in God. It's a word that can mean be encouraged. It's a word that can, be, can mean to be hardened. It's used, for example, about Pharaoh earlier in the Bible where his heart was hardened. It's used to prevail when it says David prevailed over Goliath. And here I think the idea here is that David is encouraged in God. It's the same word earlier when Jonathan went out to David and David was in despair and it said Jonathan encouraged him in God. And how did this happen? Did God appear to him in some way? Was there some miracle that, that David recognized? And I don't think there was anything like that at all. What do you think he did? How did he strengthen himself in God? And I would guess, if I had to guess, and this is a important point in the passage, but I think he would have looked back upon the fact that Samuel the prophet had anointed him to be king in Israel. That Samuel had said, you would be the king. He anointed him. And so that's the word of God to him. And this was a promise from God to him. And I think, what did he do? He believed it. He considered it to be true. He reckoned it to be true. In other words, there was a promise from God to him, and what do you know? He believed it. And by believing it, it strengthened him in God. And I think that's really the key to what happened to David in this passage. Now, we can think of other situations, too. God had been faithful to him. Remember, he had gone out to fight Goliath, and he said to Goliath, you come to me with sword and javelin and spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. He had believed that, and he had seen God deliver him. He had seen Gad the prophet give him words of encouragement. He had seen Abiathar the priest encourage him and inquire of God for him. He'd been rescued countless times in the providence of God had delivered him. But I think ultimately he had a promise of God through the anointing of the prophet Samuel that he would be king and he believed it. And I think that changed everything. And so what does he do in the next verse? Let's look in the next verse in verse 7. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, please bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David. David inquired of the Lord. Now the ephod was like a garment that a priest would wear, and he might wear it when he's inquiring of the Lord. And we might ask ourselves the question, why didn't you do this earlier? Why didn't you do this back in chapter 27? Why didn't you do this earlier? And I think we could make the argument pretty effectively. I think he was walking in the flesh for a while. And I think he was discouraged by circumstances. And Saul was pursuing him every day. And he says, there's nothing better for me than to leave the land of Israel and go to the Philistines. And upon reflection, that looks like a pretty bad choice. But in the flesh, that looked like a good choice. But here now, he's strengthened in God. And so what does he do? He inquires of God. And I think it gets him back on track. 
It says, David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this band? Shall I overtake them? And he said to him, Pursue, for you will surely overtake them, and you will surely rescue all. In other words, God answers his question, and not only answers his question, but he answers a question he didn't even ask. He just asked if he would pursue them and overtake them. And God said, yes. And he said, you will rescue all. And so David has another word from God now. And what does he do? And we see in the next verse that I think now that he believes the promises of God, he goes to God and receives a word from God, and he is activated now by faith. Look in verse 9. So David went. In other words, God gave him a word and he believed it and so he acts upon it. He went, he and the 600 men who were with him, and came to the brook Besor where those left behind remained. But David pursued he and 400 men for 200 who were too exhausted to cross the brook Besor remained behind. And so he had 600, but because of the difficulties, 200 were too exhausted, so they had to stay behind. But we see the faith of David. He continues on. And then it says in verse 11, now they found an Egyptian in the field. And I think that's interesting in the Bible where it says somebody just happened to go somewhere or somebody just happens to find something. And here I think now that he's acting by faith, walking by faith, following the word of God, he does what God says. And what do you know? Providentially, they find this Egyptian. And this Egyptian just happened to be left behind. And it says they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread and he ate. And they provided him water to drink. They gave him a piece of fig cake and two clusters of raisins and he ate. Then his spirit revived, for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. And David said to him, To whom do you belong, and where are you from? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, a servant of an Amalekite. And my master left me behind when I fell sick three days ago. We made a raid on the Negev of the Carathites, and on that which belonged to Judah, and on the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. So what do you know? They just happened upon someone who actually was involved in the raid itself. And I see the providential hand of God at work. In verse 15, David said to him, Will you bring me down to this band? And he said, Swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master and I will bring you to this band. And so we see that God providentially placed a guide to David to lead him to those who had taken all the city. In verse 16, when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken from the hand or the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And then it says, David slaughtered them from the twilight until the evening of the next day, and not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. In other words, God gave David a great victory, an enormous victory. It's almost funny the way it reads, nobody escaped except 400. And I think to myself, well, 400 sounds like quite a bit. But why would he have said it that way? And I think he said it that way because the number that were slain were so many more. So that 400 could seem like just a few got away. In other words, God gave him a great victory through these 400 because he came upon them unawares. And I think they were empowered by God and God gave them the victory. And in verse 18, so David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken and rescued his two wives, but nothing of theirs was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that they had taken for themselves. David brought it all back. And I think that's interesting, too, because sometimes I think we as people, we sometimes try to figure everything out. And we might say to ourselves, well, if he didn't lose anything at all, why did God even allow this to happen? 
And we start to think, well, maybe it was because of this, or maybe it was because of that. And I certainly think in David's life, I think David was chastising him in some ways. Last week, we saw how he delivered him from the Philistines, but there were still consequences to him walking in the flesh, and I think this was one of them. But nevertheless, in spite of those consequences, they were all saved, and they didn't lose a thing. Not one thing, even though he'd gone through the most severe of afflictions. And we would say even his own men thought of stoning him. So verse 20, so David had captured all the sheep and the cattle which the people drove ahead of the other livestock. And they said, this is David's spoil. And so I think what that means is they recovered all that they had lost, but those Amalekites had much more that they had taken from other people, and the spoil that they had taken now became David's spoil. So how is David going to respond? How is he going to react now that there's a complete victory, deliverance, and an enrichment now that they have pursued them? In verse 21, we read, When David came to the 200 men, who were too exhausted to follow David, who had also been left at the brook Besor. And they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with them, or with him. Then David approached the people and greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless men among those who went with David said, and that's probably worth noting there too, because you would think all of David's men would be great men of character. And yet here it says that even amongst David's men, there were some he calls wicked and worthless men. That's an interesting observation. And so these men said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. Then David said, you must not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us, who has kept us and delivered us or delivered into our hand the band that came against us. David is saying, God has given us a great victory, and, and freely we have received, and freely we should give, and we should appreciate these 200 because they too would have gone to the battle, but physically they were unable. They still stayed with the baggage, they still were involved and part of the team, and they are to receive a share like the rest. And I think we see David sees all things come from God, and that enables him to be magnanimous to others. And so what does it say? Verse 24, And who will listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down to the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. They shall share alike. So it has been from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance and an ordinance for Israel to this day. And now when David came to Ziklag, he sent some of the spoil to the elders of Judah to his friends saying, Behold, a gift for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. And so now what's he going to do with all this wealth that he's amassed and he's been recently enriched by? And he doesn't keep it all. As a matter of fact, it looks like he gives away most all that he received. And it looks like from the names of the towns, these were places that he had traversed and sojourned and been in those areas. And he honors those people. Now, I think also he's making friends for himself, we might say, with the mammon of unrighteousness because it won't be too long until these people will make him king of Judah. But he doesn't know that at the time, but I think he is pretty shrewd, and I think he's making some wise decisions. I mean, what a situation here with David. In other words, what do we see? Well, he goes on and he distributes more and more of these gifts. Look in verse 27. And to those who were in Bethel and to those who were in Ramath of the Negev and to those who were in Jatir and to those who were in Aror and to those who were in Sifmoth and to those who were in Eshtemoa and to those who were in Rakal and to those who were in the cities of the... And I'm, this word is... You got to be careful with this and I've been waiting for this one. Jeramielites, and if anybody can say that well, I applaud you greatly. And to those who are in the cities of the Kenites, and to those who are in the Hormah, and to those who are in Borashan, and to those who are in Athak, 
and to those who were in Hebron and to all the places where David himself and his men were accustomed to go. In other words, he distributes the spoil and he honors those who in some way it appears had honored him. And maybe he honored some who hadn't honored him. And maybe he was paving a way for what might be ahead because that's exactly what will happen as we continue on in our studies because these people will be the first to want to make him king of Judah after Saul dies. But what do we see from this passage? I mean, we see so much from this passage But I think we see here that David, by faith, turned things around. In the book of Hebrews, it talks about the heroes in the Old Testament who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign enemies to flight. We see these were mighty men. And how were they so mighty? Because it says they were weak men. But it says from weakness were made strong. And it says David was so weak he had wept all that he could weep. But God made him strong. And how did God make him strong? And I think he made him strong by faith. Because it strengthened, he said, it strength, he strengthened himself in God. He strengthened himself in God. We might say, as the New Testament says, this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. So what are the great lessons of the passage? Well, I think we could look at several of them. Maybe the first one is simply to believe. In other words, if the key verse is verse 6, where it says he strengthened himself in God, what does that mean? I mean, I don't think there was a revelation. I don't think there was some prophet that came down at that moment. I think he looked back and believed the promises of God that he had already received. I think he believed that Samuel had anointed him to be king, and he believed he would be king. And he believed the promises of God. I think he considered it to be true. The New Testament sometimes uses the word reckon something. In other words, that means you know it, but you, don't, you, you, you need to reckon it or consider it to be true. In other words, you can know something, but do you really believe it? And he then recognized what God had said, and I think he reckoned it to be true, and he acted upon it. And notice when he acted upon it, the men suddenly turn and follow him. Because he was a man of faith leading now. Instead of considering and talking to himself, he looked to God. God gave him an answer and they followed. And so I think the first thing we see is that he believed the promises of God. There's a verse in the Psalms. I don't think he wrote it, but it says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. And that's probably worth noting too. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers him out of all of them. So in other words, God is a deliverer, but we need to believe his promises. And even some good things could come out of it. Another psalm says, it is good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. So I would say David, in a very painful way, but he learned from what happened. And so the first thing I would say is believe The second thing I would say as an application is to act upon it. He was strengthened in God. He asked in prayer. God says, pursue, and what does he do? He doesn't say, well, you know, I'm not sure if God really said that or not, or let me wait and think about it for a while. He got up and pursued, and he acted upon what he believed, which God had revealed. So God reveals, he believes, and then he acts upon it. That seems to always be the pattern. God reveals where to believe it and then act upon it. In other words, even the Apostle Paul, the man who it says turned the world upside down, how did he do that? What was his secret? Well, he tells you in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, he said, I believed, therefore I spoke. Why is he this great preacher? Because he believes. Why should you and I do things that God says? Because we believe it. You say, that's pretty simple. You know, it is pretty simple. 
but it's pretty profound. And do we do it? And that's what they did. And then finally, notice the graciousness. After the victory here, he sticks up for the 200. He's magnanimous. There's a verse in Matthew where it says, freely you received, freely give. There's another one in Ephesians. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. If you're a Christian and God's forgiven you, why should you forgive anybody else? Why should you be magnanimous toward others? Because God has forgiven you and has been magnanimous toward you. In other words, you see that which has happened to him, the blessing, it goes to others. And even Jesus said, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And that sending of rain is a blessing. And that's the point that God even blesses people who don't deserve it. Because if he didn't bless people he didn't, that didn't deserve it, who would he bless? <laughs> In other words, we all need the grace of God. So, from weakness they were made strong. David was awfully weak but he came, became awfully strong. And how did he do that? I think he did it by faith, and God then worked through him. Before we leave, let's talk just a little bit about someone else in the greatest extremity, the Lord Jesus Christ. When he was at his greatest breaking point, he prays, not my will, but thine be done in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane. In Hebrews chapter 5, a verse we don't often think about, but it talks about Christ. It says, in the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. It says, Jesus was saved from death. And you say, well, how was he saved from death? I thought he died. How was he saved from death? Through resurrection. He was eternally saved from death through the resurrection of the dead. But let's stop and think for a second. But what did he do after he offered up those cries and prayers and tears? He said, not my will but thine be done. And he went to the cross and he suffered in your place and he paid your penalty and he made satisfaction and propitiation for the sins of the whole world so that you could be forgiven. And once he paid the penalty by dying in your place, then God the Father raised him from the dead. And now he offers you that forgiveness. So you and I will face an extremity called death unless the Lord returns first. And will you and I be ready? And we can be if we've trusted that Jesus died in our place, paid our penalty. Will you believe in him as your Savior? And if you trust him, the Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. Trust that his atoning death paid for your sins and you shall be forgiven. So as we wrap things up this morning, weak but made strong, how so? By faith. How are you strengthened in God? By the word of God. Reading the word, believing the word, and then acting upon it. May God give us that grace. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for each one here today. May you bless them, encourage them, and may you strengthen them in yourself. May you strengthen them, O oh God. Encourage them. May we read your word, believe your word, act upon your word, and may we be gracious to others. And if there's one here who's not sure they're forgiven, I invite you to trust in the Son of David, who in the greatest extremity prayed, went to the cross, paid your penalty, and offers you forgiveness. Will you trust him now? And how do you do that? You might pray a simple prayer. Dear God, I have broken your law. There's nothing I can do to bring about my forgiveness. But I believe Jesus Christ 
died on the cross and did everything to bring about my forgiveness. I don't trust in what I've done, but I trust in what He did. I trust in Him as my Savior. I trust in His work as the payment for my sins, and I receive Him. And I receive the free gift of eternal life. And I say, thank you, Jesus. And we praise your name. Amen.